Okay. So good morning, brothers and sisters. As we uh, prepare for this very impromptu study, should we ask the Lord for his guidance? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word, to be guided in the path that you would have us to follow. We ask, Father, that our hearts may be prepared, for we know the time in which we stand. Please, Father, help us so that our minds are prepared to receive the lessons that you would have us to, to see. Direct us. Please be with those that cannot be here for the whole meeting, that will join later via the recording, that help us in this so that we may come to an understanding of all that you have within Scripture that is important for us at this time. Be with us now, direct us, help us, so that we may learn more of our great need of you. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to bring something up I found the other day online. And we're going to play with it a little bit based on some things that Theodore had, had to say the other day. Now, what is before you should show a descendant's calculator. Can you see that? Mm hmm. Yeah. See it. Okay. So, what this does. You take a look at number of generations, years of the generations, and the average number of children. And the mathematical formula on this then produces that in 10 generations, if you have 25 years per generation, and you have an average number of children of five in that generation, that one set of grandparents in 10 generations would have 12,207,030 grandkids. And that's after about 250 years. That's a fair number of grandkids, right? That's from, yep. Now, what Theodore was talking about the other day was interesting in that we have a period of four generations in that have gone down into Egypt, right? Yeah, well, they, they lived a little longer too back then. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to disagree that they lived a little longer, but it was still four generations, right? Yeah, yeah. So, out of all of this that we're going to do today, this is going to be a very interactive kind of a study. It's also going to be kind of a game because some of the things that we're going to talk about are going to help us delve into different portions of Scripture so that we can, we can more properly consider these things. Now, we know that we had four generations, right? So we're going to take this generation line, we're going to slide it down, and we're going to look to four, just for fun. So here is four generations, with an average number of 25 years per generation, and number, average number of kids, we have five. So that produces 780 grandchildren in 100 years. Now, we have a time period of 213 years, right? From the time. Yeah. What was that? 215. 215. Okay. So we have 215 years from the time that Jacob, 
takes his family down to Egypt to be there with Joseph to the point where the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. So we have to make an adjustment in the years per generation, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to go up. 28 years doesn't make it because we can see down here, there's only 112 years that are the results of this generation. Uh -huh. So we need to come up again. But now we have 33 years per generation. Uh -huh. Well, now let's go further. Now we are at 196 years. Mm -hmm. We keep coming and we come to 216. I'm trying to get this as close to 215 as possible. Doesn't want to do it. 216 is as close as we can come. Mm -hmm. So with four generations and 54 years per generation, this calculator only shows us that it's possible for 780 grandchildren in 216 years. So I had to ask the question, why is this an issue? So you start looking at the formula, you start looking at, at everything else that's going on. Math is interesting because you can make some of these changes. You can make a change thank you, to one part of the formula and still have a result come out that makes a lot of sense. Because what we're looking for here, we know that in 215 years, Ellen White stated that there was almost 2 million people that came out of Egypt. Now, of course, it was from 70 people that went into Egypt, plus there's existing people that lived in Egypt, which would have uh, people would have been married to. Sure. That's why we had the mixed multitude. That's why we had some other issues that were ongoing, right? Yeah. But when I'm looking at the math, what I what I played with here was I asked questions. So I increased the number of children to six. Yeah, it doubles it almost. Okay. But now I'm going to, I'm going to play the math game. At this point, we know that there's four generations. At least in the one line, there may, some of the lines may have more than four generations. Right. Now, if I jump that to eight generations. You have to lower the, you lower the number of years per generation. Yep. It doesn't change the total number of children, though. It just changes yep. the number of years. Let's Let's see what happens when I cut this by half. Yeah. So mathematically, I look at the generations. I lower the number of years per generation. But I come a lot closer to what Ellen White had stated uh -huh. was that the number of number of descendants at that point would be about 2 million. Uh -huh. Now granted, this is only of one couple and their grandkids, but 2 million is what she stated came out from Egypt. Yeah. It's definitely not unrealistic. Agreed. Yeah. Um, you know, in Canada, Canada has been around for, 150 years and you know we have a population of 35 million now sure there's lo lots of immigration that has come but you could actually trace the vast you could trace 
a lot of people is directly descended from uh, the initial people who immigrated to Canada. Sure. You could, a large portion of Canadians, probably more, well more than half, are descended from original immigrants. So it, it doesn't take a lot of time uh, to increase a population, especially if you have um, other existing populations, right? Because in all these calculations, the big problem is you're just having uh, the one couple. But if you're looking at uh, adding that uh, a number of people to a population that already exists, the number of descendants from that original couple actually have a greater chance of growing um, than if you just had uh, them by themselves. So if the Israelites had gone into a place where um, there was no one else, uh, their population would have grown differently. So. Well, <clears throat> the, point, <clears throat> the point that I was considering on this was that we can show in a mathematical representation that Ellen White would be correct mm -hmm. and that there would be quite a multitude to come out from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was intrigued with it. The numbers made sense. Okay. Well, it looks, it looks pretty interesting. I wish I could be here, but I got to go. Okay. Well, you will be missed. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now, one of the things I have not yet played with on this would be to take a look at 10 generations and to see how this program could allow us to look at a time span similar to that with Adam. So let's take just a brief moment, see what we find. Let's see what 10 generations does here. See if it allows us to go up, let's see. There's a hundred years per generation, which we know is quite a bit less than what Adam and Eve had lived. So we're gonna jump this to 20 generations for fun. So in this situation, and we're going to use the same math we just did, where we doubled the generations, but we're going to take it back to a representation of being 10 generations. We're going to take this with the years per generation to 200. And this says that after about 2,000 years, that the population of the earth, if we look at this carefully, would have been four quadrillion, 387 million, 390 billion, 128 million souls. Today, we speak about global warming. That's a huge number over and above what we currently have on the earth today. So it's just, it's just something that, that is a consideration as we're looking at these things. Now, 
we're going to go in, we're going to look at something else that I had begun working on. And this is going to be a <clears throat> an opportunity for us to, to share, but also put some puzzle pieces in place. Brother Stephen has done an amazing job with his paper, Tabled History. I don't know how many have read it. I don't know how, how many have made use of it. I found it to be intriguing because of certain points that we can use as we're going forward. Now, <clears throat> the purpose that I'm looking at here is can we provide a type of a second witness to many of the events that have been being addressed? And there's, there's a major reason for this. So, those that have their Bibles, those that have their electronic Bibles, let's start looking at some things here and addressing this because this can show us quite a bit not only from the Exodus, but through the period of the judges and into the periods with the different kings. I don't know if any of you have ever considered that. In First Chronicles 6, we find a genealogy of the Aaronic priesthood through his grandson, Phinehas. Now, it's interesting to me because when we go through this, we get to see that, of course, the Jews, when they had a party that was renowned within their family, they would tend to name their children after that party. <clears throat> so we may find several Phinehas. We may find several Ahiotubes. We're going to find others and we're going to be able to put these into a line to figure out their importance. Now, it's interesting to me that we don't find more than one error just like we do not find more than one Moses. We can establish that Aaron was the high priest at the time right after they came out from Egypt, right? Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to put a date on this of 1533. It could very easily be 1532, but we're going to place it at 1533 just for the purposes of this example. And we know that Aaron died just before they were to go into the promised land. Does that also mean that Eleazar, his son, became high priest at that time? Yeah, I think so, yeah. How do we prove that? Well, Not sure. the, the whole point of our, of our study today is going to be to, to make use of our minds and also to make use of our Bibles. So, exactly. Where do we find that in the Bible?
Now, as I'm as I'm going through things right now, I'm I'm scrolling quickly. I'm going through the book of Deuteronomy to see how fast we can find this. So if anybody finds it before I do, great. So let's see what we find. Okay. Deuteronomy 30, or 31 is where Joshua is to succeed Moses. And where we find the song of Moses in 32. We have Moses' final blessing in 33. And of course, uh, 10 6, if you're talking about Eleazar taking over from Aaron. 10 6? Yeah. <clears throat> Very good. So, and the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth to the children of the children of Jakan to Mosera. There Aaron died and he was buried. So, <clears throat> We're establishing here the death of Aaron and then Elias are taking over. Now, Eleazar was priest in Israel at the time that they crossed the Jordan. And I'm seeing that we've got roughly about 31 years, 30, 31 years, where he served. How long was a priest to serve before God? And when you come up with your answer, come up with the verse as well. Where, where are we at? Okay. And what verse do we use to support that? Where in the law of Moses do we find that 20 years was the time for the priests? Numbers eight. Okay. So we have the seven lamps in Numbers eight. We have the cleansing of the Levites. 
Okay. Couldn't hear you, sorry. Yeah, 25, 25 years and upwards and 824. Okay. The service uh, tabernacle. Okay. Now, before we get to that, it's also interesting to me in Numbers 821 that the Levites were purified and they washed their clothes and Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord. Now, the reason that's interesting is because of the tie back to Exodus 19. So, <clears throat> let's see. The retirement of the Levites. This is that that belongeth unto the Levites. From 20 and 5 years old and upward, they shall go into wait upon the service of the tabernacle. And from the age of 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service and shall serve no more. So, they have a 25-year span that they are to serve in the tabernacle. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, seems to be. Okay. Okay. Did they have a similar 25-year span or did they have a 30-year span? Okay. But where do we draw that thought? Well, they started 25 years old and then they uh, cease at 50 years old. Right. There's a reason I'm asking these questions. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to scroll through this so that you can get an idea of what I'm looking at. Here's Aaron. We're establishing that Aaron would have served as high priest for somewhere around 30 years. And we should be able to look at this with Eleazar as high priest for roughly also about 30 years. We begin in 1533. Phineas began to serve approximately 1463. We know that from verse from First Chronicles six verse seven that there was a priest by the name of Ahiatub. His son Ahimelech was slain by Saul in First Samuel twenty two six to twenty three because Ahimelech was the priest that David approached received from him the showbread that was being removed, but also received Goliath's sword. Now it's Ahiatub's son, Zadok, <clears throat> that anoints Solomon at the instruction of David. But you have to go down through several generations to reach the second Azariah, which was the priest that served before Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple was not completed until 1006 BC. 
Now, as we look at this, we have a second Azariah, a, a second Amariah, a second Ahiatub. Here's another Zadok in verse 41. So you had one here that anoints Solomon. And I don't see that he's going to last, you know, a hundred or plus years. Now, here in this portion of Chronicles, We then have, after Zadok, Shalom, Hilkiah, a third Azariah, a Sariah, and Jehoshadak. And according to First Chronicles, it is Jehoshadak that was carried into captivity. I have the year listed there as 586 with a question mark. Because as we're aware, there were several captivities. But I'm using the one here that is a question because is this the one where the temple was destroyed? As we look at this, this is what I usually will do when I'm looking to prepare something because I want to understand graphically the direction in which the Bible is leading us. Okay. As I'm, as I read from different texts, I do try to give the verse. And if I haven't, I apologize but I'm also looking to try to put these verses here in this other line because we may have to refer back to them from time to time. Now, in this time frame, we have a a list of men that have served as priests. So, to me, it's interesting because here we have a list of 23 of the sons of Phinehas that are recorded as serving as priest, either in the tabernacle or in the temple. But we have a history from 14, well, actually from about 1533 to possibly down to 586 that tells us who was ministering before the Lord for the kings and for the rulers. Now, that tells us that there is a time period of what could be 947 years. I would like you to consider something just, just for fun. Where we're dealing with this, with Phinehas <clears throat> becoming priest in 1463, one of his descendants, again, Azariah, winds up serving at Solomon's temple. If we were to look at just the mathematical representation from 1463 
to the time that Solomon's temple was erected, we wind up with a time span of 457 years. Does 457 mean anything to us today? Does it mean anything? Go ahead. So it's the year of the third decree, right? I find it interesting that the decree to rebuild the temple was in 457 BC and that it is possible that there was 457 years <clears throat> that expired before the temple was dedicated initially. Is this something that happens just by chance? I don't think so. Now, the information I have here about 1006 is information that came from Stephen's tabled history. Okay, so numbers four, three. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, so that was the decree of Ezra. Okay, right. The third decree was what was being recorded in Israel. Okay, agreed. But it's interesting here from Numbers 4 3 that the priests from 30 even to 50, showing that we would at least nominally have a, a 20 year span. <coughs> However, let's, let's look at this for just a second. We have a way mark with Phinehas becoming priest in 1463. We have a way mark with Azariah serving before the temple of the Lord, Solomon's temple, in 1006. We've had in this time period 12 priests that are laid out according to this chronology. And in 457 years, that creates a, a span. that's showing about 38 years per priest. How can we reconcile some of this? I mean, there, there is a, a big reason to go into this. Now, I didn't bring up my, the Bible that I use electronically. But let's look at this. Okay, in, from the chat. In Leviticus 23.3, 24 and 27, Levites numbered from 30 years old, 20. Okay, let's go to Leviticus 23.3 and look at that, see exactly what, the, what scripture says.
Am I misreading this? I'm looking at Leviticus 23.3, and that has to deal with the Sabbath. Help me and shed some light on this, sister. <clears throat> Sorry, I might have put down the wrong reference. Um, okay. Yeah. The loveliness of ADHD. Let me find it again. Just go on, Dwight. I'll find it. Okay. Well, <clears throat> okay. Part of the situation, and this came because of a question that had been raised from the studies that we've been doing on Sabbath morning. I'm looking at a situation that many within the church, especially many pastors, do not like to look into. And that's the, the, the final three chapters of the book of Judges. Okay, so we should... I, I'm going to continue with my thought and we'll return to this. The final three chapters of the book of Judges are chapters that are very difficult for some <laughs> because they don't understand why these are recorded. Now, if you look at, at, at the way that this begins, chapter Judges 19.1 says, And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And, the concubine, and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him, Undo her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now, if we're familiar with this story, <clears throat> he comes to stay among brothers of the tribe of Benjamin. There's more than just a small altercation. the concubine is killed. There are those that would place this with a surface reading and would not look to try to figure out exactly, you know, some of the other points. What interested me about this was when I came down into chapter 20 and I'm looking this over, we find all of Israel is now going to come up against the children of Benjamin. And they come before the house of God. Now, Judges 20, verse 28, becomes very, very key to this part of the study. This is one of the later verses in this book, yet it states, And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before the Ark of the Covenant in those days. So if this is the case, then this particular chapter has to occur 
here while Phinehas was the priest. It's not a later occurrence. It may be one of the earlier occurrences in this book. Now, Brother Stephen has been very good with his tabled history. He's gone through, he's been able to show the time periods of the judges themselves. <clears throat> We've taken time to look through this step by step, and I'm sure that he's got a lot more to share. If we're able to look at this with the priests and establish a timeline for the priests, we should then be able to provide a second witness to all the work that Brother Stephen has already done. And his work is impeccable. Now, from the chat, First Chronicles 23. And I thank you for that. So we go back to 1 Chronicles 23. We have David organizing the Levites. So when David was old and full of days, he made Solomon his son king over Israel. We've already established that his son was made king over Israel at about 1017. So if that's the case... we would have this as a second witness, right? So, So the book continues, and he gathered together all the princes of Israel with priests and the Levites. Now the Levites were numbered from the age of 30 and upward, and their number by their poles, man by man, was 30 and 8,000, of which 20 and 4,000 were to set forward the work of the house of the Lord, and 6,000 were officers and judges. Moreover, 4,000 reporters, 4,000 praised the Lord with instruments, which I made, said David, to praise therewith. David divided them into courses among the sons of Levi, namely Gershon, Kohath, and Mariah. So, it doesn't say that they were to retire. at least what I'm seeing so far, but it does show that they were being divided and that there were different responsibilities. But this is saying in, instead of from 25, this is putting it from 30 and upward. <coughs> now I think we can agree that Aaron was definitely greater than 30 when he became high priest and very likely that Eliezer was the same. With these, with these situations, about 30 years from Phinehas all the way down here to Azariah the second would be about right. We would, we would have a remainder in this chronology where some would serve a little longer than 30 and some would serve less. But of the names that are here, of those that are shown as being priests in the line of Aaron and Phineas, <clears throat> what name is missing?
What name have we not addressed? When we're looking at this, in the time of the judges, did we not have a priest by the name of Eli? Yes, that would be just before Samuel. Exactly. But what does that tell us about, what does that tell us about Eli? We know that he was a Levite, but was he in the line of Aaron? Was he in the line of Phineas? My point is, I don't think he was of the line of Phinehas. <clears throat> I'm going to have to look and study some more, but I believe that he was of Aaron's other son. We're well aware of the fact that Nadab and Abihu were destroyed because they did not honor the Lord as he had commanded. We know that Phinehas did because he is the one that ended the curse that had been brought into the camp. When he slew Cosby and their paramour. But Eli <coughs> was one that while he served, and he served a long time, was not as faithful as he should have been. So we know that Eli served somewhere before Ahitub because it was his son, Ahimelech, who was killed by Saul. Which also says that there were locations for the priests that we would find within the Bible. And that there have been, and there, there should have been more than just one priest serving at that time. It's just that Eli, at, that, at his point in time that he's brought into this in, in the book of 1 Samuel, wound up serving before the Ark of the Covenant. So when I look at these things, I start looking to say, okay, how can we how can we look at this line and establish points and establish verses that tell us what was occurring? And it may be a very difficult thing to do, but I see what Stephen has done in the table's history, and he's laid it out in such a way so that we can make sense of it. In the situation with this, with, with judges, the example that we're given, especially in this with the Levite and his concubine, 
I believe is going to have a lot of import for us. I don't think that anyone has taken a look at this to say here is its relevance in the light of what we are seeing today. If this is indeed a story that, be, that should be placed at the beginning of the book of Judges, I think it sets the tone for a lot clearer understanding of things that we're going to have to look at for ourselves today. First off, by the end of this story, <clears throat> the tribe of Benjamin has been decimated. It's the activity of some of those that lived in the land that was granted to Benjamin that led to the tribes being so very upset because Benjamin was not following according to what God had laid out. How is that not unlike with what we've seen so far today within the church? God has given us a land of promise. We are to adhere to his word. <clears throat> but how often are we seeing this happen within the church today? Phineas was very direct in his, not just loyalty, but his, his passion for the word of God. Is this not what we're called to have today as well? So when I start looking at these, I start asking questions and trying to sort through the items that are important that we're going to need to look at because we know that our our calling is to come to understand what God would have us to do at this time. This is one of the reasons why, as we've been going through the studies on Sabbath mornings, we've looked at the words, we've looked at the considerations of <clears throat> what makes three days important, what makes the third day important. We're pulling all of these things out so that we can look at it to understand and be guided for our time today. I believe this movement is comprised of those that will be the Levites and the priests. But we need to understand what the responsibilities of the Levites and the priests have been. Now, <clears throat> Theodore had asked me very much off the cuff to, to lead the study today. I'm not trying to ignore what he's, what he's been accomplishing. I find that many 
of the lessons that have been coming forth have led to a lot of other questions, but they're good questions because we need to be studying this more for ourselves. <laughs> Do you have questions from what we have studied on Sabbath mornings? I mean, my, my focuses there have been primarily to look at this in regard to the covenant. Because so much of that history, I think we're going to have to understand if we're really going to be seeking to seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We cannot see that happen until we've come into unity. And I think the examples that are given from Exodus, from Nehemiah, from Leviticus, from the Gospels are so very clear for us. But maybe it's only clear to me. Do you have questions on that? And do you have questions on what we've talked about so far today? Are you there? Have we, have we lost connections? No, um, I'm here. But uh, okay. 1463, is that the, the date you have uh, for the death of um, Joshua? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, because... Yeah, so that, that would be his largest... The oldest he would be, you know, I think he would, that would be the latest he would die. Okay. Yeah, the, the way that I had read that, Stephen, was that it looked as if Eleazar and Joshua had died in the same year. <clears throat> and I stand ready to be corrected on that. Yeah, I haven't checked out Eleazar. Um, if I was going to guess, yes, I would say Joshua died that year. But I haven't yeah. looked into LAs or, you know, I haven't. That could be a possibility. Okay. Now, using, I, I mean, I'm I'm finding so much within your your tabled history paper that has just, I mean, it's been a total revelation. I mean, there, there's so many points that you're bringing out there that I have to ask, you know, how? I mean, you've done an amazing amount of work. The Lord has really been leading you to this. So... I'm just trying... You know, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's been a lot of work, but uh, it's been like a labor of love. I can understand. So in this, I mean, with the with the different priests, I find it to be intriguing because of the the different little pieces of information <clears throat> that are being recorded in scripture, and to. To have this one, especially with, um, well, 
where David calls Zadok to have Solomon anointed. And I think that, that you placed it that David died about 1017. Correct? Yes. So I think maybe like a few months after Solomon becomes king. Right. But it was intriguing to me that we have five different priests after Zadok coming here to when Azariah the second begins to serve before Solomon's temple. So we have these five and then we have eight basically going from Azariah down here to Jehoshadak when they're carried into captivity. And I'm having to place Jehoshadak's carried into captivity as probably being 586 when the temple is destroyed. So that would be like five priests in the matter of what's 11 years or maybe less. Right. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. I haven't seen that before. So the one that, that really struck me here was this with Ahiatub because it's recorded that Ahiatub was the, the father of Ahimelech, and it was Ahimelech that was slain by Saul. So we know that there was only one priest at a time that would serve in front of the Ark of the Covenant, because there's only one Ark. But does that mean that there was only one priest that was officiating at those specific times? It would look that we had other Levites, of course, that were to be teachers, but that the priests may have had other cities in which they were serving. See, the ark, um, after it was removed from Shiloh, yes. went to the, to the Philistine cities, and then it came back. Right. And it stayed, it stayed in the house of Obed-Edom, I think it was. Okay. And basically lay there until um, David took it. Or how long? No, I went to Obadiah after. As I was slain, I think it was somebody else's house that I stayed at. Right. Um, I can't remember. Kind of, <laughs> Kurjath. Tirith or something, I think it stays there. And then David tries and moves it, as it dies. So it stays with Obadiah for about three months. And okay. then it's taken, it's taken into Jerusalem. And so, so by the time around Saul, I know there's a, like a tabernacle. It's, I don't think it's like a, the official. The, the taber, tabernacle, I think, just remained it. Uh, Shiloh, I don't, I'm not too sure whether it was moved. Well, I think it did. Maybe it did move somewhere else. But the <clears> priests, were, <throat> priests were in Nob. I don't think that the, that's where Abimelech was killed by Doeg. So I don't think the uh, tabernacle, oh, sorry, the, the Ark of the Covenant was actually there at that time. 
okay, your point or a point that I'm taking from this, when we find that in 1 Samuel 7, it talks about the men of Jath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it unto the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And then 1 Samuel 7, 2, and it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. After this point, we begin to see that Samuel was judging Israel. Yes. So we know that there was a, a time period where the ark was in the hands of the Philistines. Yes. And it's showing here that there's a period of 20 years where the ark was not at Shiloh and it was not at Jerusalem. Uh -huh. So we have a time period <clears throat> there that gives us a piece of the puzzle so that we would be able to possibly more directly place it within this chronology. We would just have to look, you know, who was serving where and about what time. We know that Ahatub, his son, was slain by Saul. So somewhere within these seven, we have the situation with Eli and his sons, and we have the situation of the ark coming back from the Philistines, but not going back to Shiloh. Yes. Now, as that relates to things today, would this be a a current example for us of the glory having departed from the church? I mean, <clears throat> everything that we're studying right now is a message from God and we can make applications with what's occurred in the past. So I'm seeing this and I'm having to wonder, isn't there a further application that we would be able to see for today? What do you think? Of course there is. Okay, but what would you, how would you? Nothing new under the sun. All things are written for examples for our ad admonition unto, unto whom the ends of the world are come. But where could we place this 20-year period in our history? That's part of the reason why when, when I look at... I, I find look, out go ahead. Marks it. We have to find out what marks it. What mark would mark to... 20 years. Okay. This is part of the reason for a study like this. All of us have different perspectives of what we're looking at. There are so many different points that Brother Jeff, Brother Stephen, Adilio, Theodore have all brought out that we all need to be considering. A study like this allows others to be able to take a look at what's already in scripture and for us to take a look for ourselves where we think a piece like this could be useful.
So, <clears throat> as I said at the outset, something like this could be used as a good second witness to all the work that Stephen has been doing in, in, in his paper, Tabled History. How many other pieces of the puzzle can we find? Well, there's a lot. We should be able to place this. I mean, this, this portion right here about where the Ark was residing in Kirjath Jerem, we know that this is happening before Saul becomes king. We know that Saul was not king about 1463 in the year that Joshua died. So we should be able to start to identify where in here we can look at this. That's why figuring out the amount of time that the priests were serving and looking at these to understand a bit more of this history can help us to start putting the puzzle pieces into a place so that we can make better sense of what we're seeing. For me, it's no different than looking at the situation with the covenants. Because if we start to understand the covenant that God looked to enter into with Israel, with all of Israel, it helped us come into focus with the covenant that he entered into with the Levites. And it makes the warnings and the admonitions of the book of Malachi even more direct for us today. Uh, just looking at the references to the ark and First Samuel, so after, uh, so we stayed in the house of Abinadab. Now David asked the house to remain then when David brought it out, and then also was killed. So it remained there pretty much through much of Samuel's time as, um, as a priest. Okay. And then Saul's time as well. But there's a, it's mentioned in, um, once in, uh, that seems to be brought out when uh, Saul was having problems with the, the Philistines, that's in 1 Samuel 14. Okay. All right. So, 1 Samuel 14. Verse 18. And verse 18. So, that says, And Saul said unto... Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. Right. And it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased, and Saul said unto the priest, withdraw thine hand. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So there's so that's the only time. That's the only time it's really mentioned between that uh, time when uh, it's put in the house of Abinadab. Okay. And then David bringing right. it in. So it must have been in that house for maybe could be like a hundred years or so. Could easily. Yes, easily, maybe more. So is First Chronicles an incomplete chronology of the priests? Yeah. 
Yeah, because it doesn't mention the higher. Yeah, agreed. So it doesn't mention a higher and in verse seven. Um, we've got the house of Abinadab and they sanctified Eleazar to keep the Ark of the Lord. So here we have Abinadab and Eleazar that are not mentioned either. Mm -hmm. You find in the uh, genealogy of Christ in Matthew. Yes. It skips, it skips some of the kings as well. It doesn't mention Joash, for example. And so I don't know whether that's another thing that's going on here with the, the priests that are sort of skipping some generations. Okay. So there's actually quite a bit here because, as you pointed out, and as we've been discussing, if a high tube is the father of Ahimelech, and we're recording that in 1 Samuel 22, Zadok the priest anointing Solomon in 1017 at the end of David's life would have been that that would have been a span of about 60 you know let's let's say 60 years at, at the most from this situation where Ahimelech is slain by Saul yeah could be possibly as much as that maybe not quite as much but yeah 50 maybe something around 50s okay So there's, there's quite a bit here to look at. I mean, it, it's, like a, it, it's like a large puzzle where we've just gotten certain pieces that we're looking at, but we're finding that there's other pieces to fit in. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's showing me that there's, there's quite a bit more to look at in this type of a study in order for this to be a, a proper witness to what was going on. Mm -hmm. So... So now, do we have any other comments or questions? Any other thoughts on, on some of the items that we've talked about today? I just noticed in 1 Samuel 14, 3, that Ahia or Ahia, the son of Ahitab, I don't know if anybody noticed that, so... Well, let's look at it real quick. <clears throat> you said First Samuel fourteen three, and uh, Ahia fourteen three, yeah. And Ahia, the son of Ahiatub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. So Ahia. the son of Ahitub, which was Ichabod's brother, which that would have made him the grandson of Eli. And 
and they're not mentioning Ahimelech, which is interesting too. Okay, so there's quite a bit more to look at. So, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for these examples that you are showing us so that we may learn more of your mercy and your grace. Help us, Father, that we may truly treat your scriptures as a minor searching for precious gems, for precious jewels, for precious metals, for only in you is everything precious found. Direct us through this day. Help us in all that we do. Guide us in the path that you would have us to walk. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.